Hampton was on Siemens, and uh, David as a, as a uh, evangelist, as a, kind of part of that job title, which is, which is unusual a little bit. Um, you're looking at a uh, lens cap on the surface of Venus. Back when the Russians were still <coughs> launching probes in the mid 80s, they launched the Venera 14, it landed. On, uh, on, the, on, on the surface of Venus and started doing its job. They popped its lens cap, started taking pictures, and uh, then it starts to test the soil. And what makes this picture interesting is where the lens cap landed, right below the spot where it would test the soil. So rather, rather than testing the soil, it tested the lens cap, sent back a message to the Russians that there's a vent polymer molecules on the surface of Venus. <laughs> they smoothed their camera and took this picture. This tells us a number of interesting lessons. One is that the laws of Murphy, anything that can go wrong, will go wrong, are universal. You're familiar with some of the other laws, like, for example, uh, any line you stand in will be the slowest. Uh, toast always falls butter side down. The one that came here to prove is anytime you drop something, it'll end up in the worst possible spot. <laughs> now, of course, back here on Earth, they're beginning to recognize the fact that Murphy is everywhere. They've even started to take it seriously in various universities. For example, at Acton University in the UK, they set up the Center of Excellence. They enlisted the uh, Daily Telegraph in the UK to begin testing various laws of Murphy. For example, toast falls butter side down. They enlisted 1,000 students to perform 20 samples each of toast falling off the edge of their plate. And they found that 63.2% uh, of toast falls butter side down. And I don't know what you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, it's because the butter is on one side of that toast. That's why it does it. They redid the test, this time with a Sharpie with the letter B on the side of it. And it still came back 62.3% falling butter side down. Now, that is not random. Toast falling butter side down is not random. And we could talk about the various issues about why it is what it is, but heck, I've got a few minutes. I might as well talk to you. The reason toast can't do a full gainer off the top of your plate is because of the gravimetric constant, 32 feet per second squared. In order to pull a full gainer for your toast, to do a full gainer off the edge of the plate, it has to be 10 feet off the ground. How come your plates are 10 feet off the ground? Because your tables aren't that tall. And so toast is pre predisposed to fall butter side down. That means you're not paranoid that the world is out to get you, <laughs> including toast is out to get you. So, let me back up here for just a second. So, now it turns out, of course, that these laws of Murphy are in full force in any complex system. You want proof I have here in my hand a recall notice I received from Honda about the Takata airbags. How many else in this audience got one of these notices? This is an interesting sample. There were some 55 million of these, not just this, but generally in the automotive industry in the U.S. If you check out the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, there's 55 million of these recalls in the United States during 2016. It got better in 2017, but just a mere 37 million recalls that happened in there. Now, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration estimates that the cost of a recall is $100 per recall per vehicle. So you can see that some five and a half billion dollars was spent in 2016 on this problem. Uh, not to mention the lives that were lost along the way. Now, of course, it's shown up in many other places as well. Um, I remember being a, uh, because I was the youngest engineer in the group, I was designated as the delivery boy for some bad news of this type in one of the programs I was working on. And after the uh, program managers finished swearing, they uh, said, Samson, why don't you give me something where I can see this problem coming? This is like driving a car looking through the rear view mirror. And I think that's probably part of our problem generally. And I'm, my talk today is about how you justify an investment in something that may or may not happen at some point in the future. Because after all, system engineer is in the business of keeping bad things from happening. Right? And so if you think about this idea, the accountants in the world and the managers in the world are in the business of trying to save money they're already spending, right? So they're looking at the rearview mirror. That's what they care about is what's happening in the rearview mirror, but they're not doing anything about the future. And so that's where system engineering is supposed to come in and help solve this problem. Now part of the problem when one of these problems happen, like for example, you can think of any number of recalls that are out there like the Takata airbag, is it gets difficult to kind of extract the reasons, the decisions, all the other kinds of things that went into getting us to where we are, right? 
And so the end result is we often lose these lessons along the process. And so in the, as we got thinking about this problem, how you justify an investment system engineering and model-based systems engineering, what if we could find more of these experiences and document the decisions that went along in this process mm -hmm. and get it into a case study that you would prove to the accountant that maybe this journey was worth the effort to avoid these future costs. Mm -hmm. Thus, the uh, allegory of the identifier that I'm about to relate to you guys. I, I did this back in 1997. By the way, it was a paper that was submitted to Nicosia. It was rejected because, <laughs> because it wasn't serious enough, is what they, is what they said. Um, it went on the poster paper list, and somebody dropped out, and I, and I got pulled in to do the poster presentation. And the paper won the best paper that year, back in 1997, because people recognized that they resonated with this. So what's with this humidifier? Okay. Uh, it's a story about the decisions that we experienced. Now, first off, let me tell you right up front, this is a true story. It just didn't, because it didn't happen overnight, we didn't recognize it. But I kept a, I kept a journal on this experience, and I have the decisions that were made that got us where we are. So this is a case study, if you will, that could be, and I, I know what's going to happen. As I start relating this story to you, you're going to say, no, that couldn't possibly be true. But then what you're going to say is, oh, you know, that sounds kind of familiar, right? in your own experiences, and you'll see it. So what's with this humidifier? Well, the electrostatic plotters are used in many organizations. This was in a, working in a chip factory kind of situation, and we were using these high-speed electrostatic plotters to put the, the chip uh, layouts, program schedules, those kinds of things. Now, electrostatic plotting process requires a magnetically charging a point on paper. That requires special environmental conditions humidity, temperature, and so forth. And it turns out that many times these electrostatic plotters are co-located in the computer rooms because that's the perfect environmental situation for them. So in the heyday of the site, when we were expanding the site, these humidifiers, I'm sorry, these uh, electrostatic plotters were located in the computer room. And in order to make additional space for additional computers, we decided we would move these humidifiers out of the computer room out to a centrally located room where they could now be closer to engineers. So we could put more computers in the computer room. Well, that room was built by facilities, and we gave them the requirement that we maintain this humidifier, this, this room at 50% humidity. Well, because facilities had not, uh, you know, to maintain that kind of level of humidity was really going to require some serious humidifiers. Commercial grade humidifiers to do that kind of job are about $10,000. And since facilities, well, it's also going to require condition uh, water, it's going to condition additional plumbing, all those other kinds of things. And because facilities hadn't engineered that or, or budgeted their capital for it, they decided instead to roll in a uh, household humidifier. <laughs> they bought it from Sierra, $60. They rolled it in, plugged it in, turned over the owner's manual. And so within a few days, it was discovered it was discovered that a single humidifier couldn't keep up the humidity level. So therefore, they went and got another one. So we have two humidifiers here from Sears that are doing the job that was originally spec'd up for a better humidifier. Well, so each of these humidifiers about, evaporates about 10 gallons of water per day. So two five-gallon buckets were acquired, and two trips were needed to the nearest custodial closet to fill these buckets up. Now, since nobody wanted to do that job, he was also relegated to the low man in the telephone to haul the water from the custodial closet to these humidifiers on a daily basis. After several complaints about snide comments made about the water boy to the drafting manager, the job was added to the daily duty roster and rotated on a daily basis. Uh, policies and procedures were worked out for how you get out of this job. So, for example, if you're going on vacation, you would get an exception or get somebody to trade with you. Um, uh, if you had a disability, you had to have a doctor's note. Or if you had a uh, gender kind of thing, you couldn't wait less, that's why it was. That's the policies that was worked out. And, of course, not everybody hauling water was careful, so the water was spilled along the floor along the way. And several trips and falls, slips and falls, happened as a result of water being on the, on the floor. Um, now it wasn't too long before somebody threw out their back calling water, resulting in an expensive, expensive workman's comp claim. If that wasn't enough, it showed up on the annual attitude survey, where the attitude in the drafting department took a sharp fall. A number of lengthy meetings were called to find out what went wrong and how come the attitude didn't take this a sharp fall. And it was found out that these, these humidifiers could be the source of part of the problem. <laughs> That's when the quality improvement team got involved. <laughs> <laughs> and they happened to have a plumber on the team, so they came up with this idea of running a line, a water line to the humidifiers for the house, and, and they could fill them up that way. Now, they did some brainstorming. They came up with this crazy idea that we could, you know, these humidifiers could fill themselves up if we just give them some pour pouch. 
And so what they did is they, they drew up a, a design. Here's the napkin, as you can see. I'm not going to have to with the idea being that these things just film themselves. They wanted a, a quality improvement idea of the month on the company, and they got a free lunch out of this whole experience. Be sure this humidifier uh, back in that and drawing over to uh, facilities to do the engineering associated with it. Um, they decided that float valves can fail and it stay open, so they decided that rather than, than just hook it up merely with a hose to a, humid, to a float valve, you need to have a double redundant system that would prevent this mixture falling. So they put in so we're down to servo cutoff valves with electronic level sensors and everything else to get what we want. We, uh, we call it the automatic double redundant automatic humidifier refill system. <laughs> and this, they put it in and installed it over, over a weekend because we're on production up the way. So it's overtime. Uh, the little force involved as you see the result. Here's the finished product for us. Uh, I received, as a cost center manager at the time, I received a $7,800 engineering and material bill associated. The first failure of the automatic double <laughs> took place over a weekend. Uh, we were greeted by uh, several inches of water over several thousand square feet in the uh, in the area. Um, we called facilities. The guy who came in and got the water shut off. They found out that a copper sliver had somehow got between in the servo valve and left to force it open. They got that taken care of. Got the pipes blown out. Uh, they got the water dry cleaned up. They brought rented special high speed drying equipment. Um, of course, the drywall, part of the drywall had to be replaced and the carpet had grown mildew and needed to be replaced as well. <laughs> now, these, these humidifiers uh, were running 24 by 7 and, and uh, household humidifiers are not built to run 24 by 7 by the end of doing and so as a result of that, the plastic parts began to wear out. Uh, these humidifiers were on the critical path. Their humidity is required to plot the critical growing and the critical project. And so maintenance was calling to resolve this issue. They made a call to Sears to see if they had any spare parts for these humidifiers. Of course, Sears can carry spare parts for household humidifiers. So they went to the model shop and got the model shop to, to make some parts for us. To do that. <laughs> the facility says, we've got to put this under maintenance. They call Sears to see if there's a service agreement available for less than four hour response time on these household humidifiers. And of course, for some reason, they did not offer that. <laughs> <laughs> So we had to do this maintenance ourselves. So they uh, figured out which parts to get ordered. They ordered all the parts, and of course, you just don't order parts. You have to have the drawing inspections, all the other kinds of things that go along with it, and they added a number of parts. That's when another quality improvement team got involved <laughs> in the process, and they decided that there was X number of uh, uh, 20 parts that could be eliminated because they're at six sigma failure levels, and therefore they could be eliminated. That saved them $2,000 per part. They also won. Well, there began to be a rash of respiratory and other illnesses in the area, and they were beginning to wonder why, and so the expensive sick building study was ordered to figure out what was the source of these illnesses that were taking place and showing up in our overhead accounts. It was designated that maybe these humidifiers might be a source of some of these problems, so cultures were taken and we confirmed that these humidifiers were the source. Something was growing in these humidifiers. Now, since the, since the um, Automatic double redundant refill system had the humidifier refill system wasn't built for quick disconnect like we originally planned. Remember, Risk and Ohio Hose. It, it takes a plumber and an electrician several hours each to disconnect so these humidifiers could be cleaned. So we decided we would take a chemical approach instead. So chlorine bleach would be added on a periodic basis to the humidifiers and it was added to the, 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 to the weekly duty roster to get that done. <laughs> now, if you know this or not, chlorine is considered a hazardous chemical. And so therefore, we would need a new vault, a hazardous chemical vault was purchased, so this it would destroy this hazardous chemical bleach. And, and also, of course, there was uh, special training required, so all the drafting personnel received special training in how to handle this hazardous chemical. Um, also, the hazardous chemical use uh, information from the site needed to be updated and regulatory approvals. The signage on house town signs on the side of your building that you always wonder about was updated as well as a result of this. Plus, additional procedures were put in place for the disposal of these hazardous chemical empty bleach containers. Now, what both see in the humidifiers is not an exact science. And so all the spills happened and clothes were ruined and they had to be replaced, which caused, caused the uh, people who were doing the dose for that day to uh, put on job jackets and safety glasses. Uh, the brown carpet also had its share of white spots. 
But it wasn't too long before someone overdosed the human fire and chlorine fumes became overwhelming in parts of the building. A hazardous chemical emergency was called. Parts of the building <laughs> were evacuated and the city hazardous chemical response team was called in to figure out what went wrong. The result of that, of course, is that um, we weren't allowed to use chlorine anymore. And, uh, and facilities started charging me $300 per month to have those systems disconnected, cleaned, and refilled. When the site shutdown was finally announced, um, the rumor was it was because we just weren't productive enough, that we weren't making enough money, or a bad attitude, but we all knew it was the humility. <laughs> <laughs> now, as I related that experience to you, it's all true. I, I, I documented it along the way. Um, you were beginning to think about your own humidifier experience. <laughs> And I fully expect to get several emails from you guys saying, oh yeah, I can top that. <laughs> the point here wasn't to make fun of the electrostatic plotters or facilities or any of those other kinds of things that go along with it, but merely to point out to you guys the obvious downstream potential impact of short-term decision making. Systems engineering is in the business of avoiding future risk, future problems. It was obvious for us to see all these potential impacts downstream that were going to take place. If we just took a step back and looked at the big picture, we could have justified, of course, the short-term decision was to just get purchasing a $10,000 humidifier to help solve this problem correctly. But we didn't make that decision. In and of itself, it was probably okay, but if we looked at the big picture, we know better than that. So this process, or part of the problem, of course, is the system engineering in and of itself is a depreciates as you go through a project. The value gets less the longer you wait to apply systems engineering, right? You guys have all know what this is, right? It is the icon of American, American playgrounds. Foreigners may not see this as quite often, but what is this? This is a teeter-totter. And as a, as a novice of teeter-totter, you guys all went to the teeter-totter, and you know where the leverage on a project is, right? It's way out in the early part of the stages of the project. And if I lay a program on a project schedule timeline underneath it, you can see that all the leverage is way up front in this early stages of the life cycle. This is why Simon Remo, that's the R in TRW, he, in a, in a quote from his keynote stage that he gave here in 1997, he said, all the really bad mistakes are made the very first day, right? And that's true because this is where all the leverage is. Now, the longer you wait to do system engineering, you see the leverage gets less and less. Don't be wrong. You can still do system engineering, there's still value in doing it, it's just the value is less the longer you wait to apply it. Which results in a great deal of waste. And when I say the word waste to you, you guys think about lean, right? You guys think about lean and the various eight kinds of lean waste there are. There's the, the waste of, uh, of uh, transportation, waste of batch processing, those kinds of things. Well, let me leave you with one final quote from uh, this one number right here. I'll remember this in a second. You guys are Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker, I'll paraphrase his thing, there's no greater waste than doing efficiently something that shouldn't be done at all. <laughs> Thank you.